Paul and Barnabas set sail, and on their missionary journey, people believe in Jesus, while persecution rises to threaten their lives. On The Bible Brief. Have you left a review of the show on your podcast player? Help us stand out to potential listeners by quickly posting a review. Thank you for helping The Bible Brief. From the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, concerning believers in the Lord. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated of whom the world was not worthy. The persecution isn't going away. James the Apostle was killed by the king of Judea, and Peter was recently imprisoned by the same. Just as their teacher had said, as the authorities hated him, so they would hate his disciples. The way of the master was the way of trials, but at the end of this road stood the Lord and his kingdom. The tribulation in this life would always be worth the glory in the age to come. So the disciples kept pushing forward, with eyes not on their crosses, but on their Savior. The church in Antioch was exploding in growth, and at 300 miles to the north of Jerusalem, it was far away from the center of persecution happening at the time. It was here where Saul and Barnabas had had their hand in the work of the Lord. Barnabas had initially come here on his own over a year prior, before going further northwest to get Paul from his hometown of Tarsus. Then back at Antioch, they spread the gospel message to see more and more growth of the believers in the city. It was in Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. But these Christians wouldn't be able to keep Saul and Barnabas in their midst. Because after about a year of ministering in the area, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And in obedience, after fasting and praying for the men, they set them off to sea. Saul and Barnabas would go on their first missionary journey to areas that hadn't yet heard the gospel of the kingdom and the salvation made available by Jesus. So off they went about 150 miles by boat into the Mediterranean Sea to the port city of Salamis on the island of Cyprus, where upon arriving, they immediately began to proclaim the good news. Now, given that this was an area less dominated by Jewish culture, Saul went by his Roman name Paul rather than his Jewish name Saul and would for much of his missionary endeavors. So Paul and Barnabas started in the Jewish synagogues, and they went around the whole island spreading the message of the kingdom of God, a message received by many. Then having done the initial pass through the island, they departed again by boat northward into the southern coast of modern Turkey. They continued preaching and teaching in the Jewish synagogues, until finally they came to a city called Antioch. Not the Antioch where they'd previously spent over a year, No, this was Pisidian Antioch, a city far northwest of the Syrian Antioch from which they had initially departed on this journey. So here at Pisidian Antioch, their missionary endeavor would meet great success and great resistance. As was their normal course, on Saturday, the Sabbath, they were attending the synagogue when the rulers of the synagogue came to them with quite an opportunity. They said to the disciples, Brothers, If you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it, and you know that Paul took them up on that offer. On that day, the city would hear words of a sort that they'd never heard before. So Paul began addressing both the Jews and the Gentiles who believed in the God of Israel. Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt and with an uplifted arm he led them out of it. And for about forty years he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. 
All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's seed, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption in the grave. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption, as David prophesied in the psalm. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Paul mentions the panorama of Israel's history, hitting many of the high points in his expression of the gospel to the people. He mentions Abraham's family, the resistance of the Israelites in the wilderness, the kings up to David, and in this presentation, he focuses on the fact that Jesus is both the promised seed of David and the resurrected one about whom David prophesied. Finally, he ends with the greatness of forgiveness from sins, followed by a warning against rejecting the message. Surely, Paul and Barnabas looked out on the synagogue hoping for an amazing harvest of believers. But it wasn't so. All were curious and wanted to hear more, but few became believers. They did, however, come back to even bigger crowds the next Sabbath day. In fact, word had spread throughout the whole city about the message of these men, and everyone came out to hear what they had to say. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you Jews, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us by the prophets, saying about Jesus, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles of the city heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, was fulfilling his mission, though not neglecting to first share the gospel with the Jews of each place. He shared that their king had come, before he turned to the Gentiles with the same message. You can imagine then how the Jews who rejected the gospel began to react to this news. Soon the Jews incited the leading people of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But the disciples shook off the dust from their feet against them and went on to the city of Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Though this visit to the city of Pisidian Antioch ended in persecution, it wasn't without great success in sharing the hope to be found in Jesus. Many believed and the disciples rejoiced as the Holy Spirit, who always dwelled in them, filled them once again, empowering them to continue their journey. 
The next city was more of the same. More Jews and Gentiles believing the gospel. More persecution stirred up by the unbelieving Jews. But after that, they came to the city of Lystra, where Paul would be hailed, not as herald of good news, but as a god of the pantheon. Paul was there preaching in the city, and as he looked over the crowds, he saw a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looking intently at him, and seeing that he had the faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lycaonian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. Things in Lystra had escalated quickly. As soon as Paul heals the crippled man, the city assumes that he is a god and that Barnabas beside him is Zeus himself. They even call the priest of the pagan temple in Lystra to come to sacrifice oxen to these gods who'd come to town and healed the man. It would be a comical scene if it weren't so serious in actuality. These people wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas. But when the two men heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things into a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without a witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your heart with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Given this context among all these Gentiles, Paul preaches another very short sermon, appealing to the kindness of God to all the Gentile nations of the world. He says that in former days of their ignorance, God showered rains upon them and allowed their prosperity. Yet Paul says that the good news he brings is that this God is inviting them to turn from this vanity of all these false gods like Hermes and Zeus. Instead, he invites all nations to come and follow him. Surely Paul was hoping that this would all work toward a great salvation in the city. Yet this superstitious crowd continues to try to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, not listening to the message from their mouth. This raucous crowd, was venerating the men as gods. But in just a short time, they would be condemning the very ones they now worshipped. Soon, Jews from the two prior cities that the disciples had visited came to Lystra to warn them about Paul and Barnabas, and the crowds began to listen. Then they turned. Now the gods became criminals in their eyes. They rushed at Paul, They began throwing stones at him. They pummeled him as Stephen had been pummeled years prior. They dragged him out of the city, and they abandoned his bruised and limp body. Surely in that moment, as he looked upon his partner in ministry, Barnabas remembered the words of Jesus, words he'd heard the apostles preach back in Jerusalem. Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This was the way. Persecution, swords, prison, crosses, stonings. This was the way of the master. Join us next time as we go back to Jerusalem for a big meeting. Debate has sprung up because these new Gentile Christians are violating the law of Moses.
The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.